All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Larry Williams, and I'm the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARM, at Wayne State University. And uh, we're delighted to have you join us uh, for this Meet the Methodologist interview session with Dr. Mike Hitt from Texas A&M University. And a special shout out to those of you who are watching us live on Facebook. Uh, as you may know, Mike is uh, visiting Wayne State in Detroit today to give a lecture this afternoon as part of our Karma Consortium webcast program. And uh, when we have distinguished visitors here sharing their expertise, uh, we also like to take the time to have uh, what we hope is a sort of an informal chat uh, that talks about career and research and uh, life-related issues. So uh, Mike, over the years, has been a big uh, champion of research methods in the area of strategic management, and so we're just very happy to have him. Mike? Okay. Well, pleasure, pleasure to be here, Larry. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to begin with a general question about how was it that you got interested in uh, the area of strategic management? Well, it's, it's somewhat interesting for me in the sense that uh, I guess I started uh, graduate work and, and in my early graduate work in the master's program, I was interested really in HRM and, and more micro topics will be. And uh, then after getting an MBA, I went into industry in a corporate, I worked in a corporate HRM department or HR department. But in, in the jobs that I was assigned, one of them was uh, to uh, work on an exec help design an executive incentive compensation pro program. So I worked with uh, somebody in the corporate finance group and the vice president, we called vice president of finance, it'd be a CFO today. Um, and we worked on uh, designing this program, but in that I interacted with a lot of the top executives. Uh, both on the corporate level and in the running some of the major businesses, and became very interested in what they did and how they because because you're designing a program hopefully to help them perform better or to encourage them to perform better, and uh, so that uh, and I interacted with uh, board of director members so it got me a little bit focused at a different level and the kinds of activities decisions and so on that they made. Then a, a second thing happened uh, near the end of my time there. Uh, the firm I was working with got acquired by another firm. And I observed uh, the merger and uh, how it went, which didn't go too well. And, and trying to understand, you know, mergers, it got me interested in mergers and acquisitions. And so I, when I went into the PhD program, I kind of had this, I'll say, dual focus, but I had a more, a stronger interest probably in the macro side because of the experiences I had. So that's why. So uh, you go into your doctoral program and uh, I was wondering whether there was a particular methods course or a statistics course uh, that you took as a graduate student that had a big impact on you and if so, why? Well, there was. Uh, the, the one that had the biggest impact on me was a multivariate statistics course that I had. It was actually taught in the marketing department. Uh, and where I was, uh, and in fact, the person who taught that was on ended up being on my PhD uh, committee. But it did just simply because I, I learned a tremendous amount in that uh, in that course, and it uh, probably helped me tremendously not just in in the program, but more so after I finished and in some of the research I did. So uh, and and laid a good foundation or framework for me to keep learning. Uh, new tools and, and methods. So that, that was a very important course to me. Yeah. So do you recall any of the particular uh, challenges, whether it's with that course or just more broadly with learning research methods and statistics while you were a doctoral student? Well, for me, and I, I can say this in retrospect, you know, I don't know that I knew it as well, knew that I was missing it in the doctoral program, but we really didn't have methods courses. Uh, I, I really learned statistics and some really good tools. And part of that, you, you know, you learn something about methods if, if you have good uh, stat classes, and I did. So there's no doubt that I learned some things from that, but I didn't have a philosophy of science course. I did some reading, but I didn't really have a course that uh, really that was the main focus or some other design issues that I think would have been helpful to me, like at A&M. We have a two-course sequence in research methods and research design in addition to and outside of, in a sense, of the, the statistics courses. And I would have liked to have had that. I've kind of had to learn all of that on my own, if you will, 
uh, through trial and error, which you know, always a lot of error, and you learn a lot from errors. Uh, but I that I would say I missed it, but I didn't realize it when I was in the program till later. Yeah. Uh, if I can uh, go off script a little bit and ask a follow-up, uh, I'm just curious whether you could take a guesstimate and identify, you know, any point in time since when you were a graduate student where it became more common for strategy students to actually get a research methods course as part of their doctoral program. Well, I, I would say it probably uh, would be uh, Guessing uh, late '80s, early '90s, you know, strategy is a is a field is is a young field relative to, uh, say, OB, HRM, or IO psychology, obviously. Uh, so, it it's really developed. And I, you know, when I got in, when I was in the PhD program, what we call what would be called strategy today was called business policy. And actually, my courses were all taught in business policy by they were trained as economists. Uh, very, very good people, so there's not a, not a negative there. Uh, but, but the side is that we really didn't have kind of research methods per se uh, in training uh, in the strategy area. And if we had training, it came from more of the micro side uh, on that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was true for some time until maybe about the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say that's when it probably started. Yeah, yeah. So, um, You've obviously been engaged in empirical research a lot since that time. Uh, do you have a favorite methods book or a stat book that's kind of you, you have sitting by uh, by your desk so that you can access it that you rely on? Huh. Well, that, now that's interesting. I, I'd say today no, because I, I I go to a lot of different uh, books or, mm -hmm. or sources uh, depending on the tool that I'm using, and and I learn new tools. I've learned quite a few over the years to help me. You know, if I go back, uh, the uh, uh, Econometrics uh, by Johnston was a kind of a base book for me. I had a multivariate book by Tatsuoka that I remember, I, and I, refer I used both of those over time, particularly early in my career, quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Tatsuoka, a lot of matrices. Oh, yeah, there, there are. There are. I also would say that, uh, I want to tell you, that the SPSS manual, was very useful and because because it was very much more explanatory than most of the other uh, books at that time and, and, and the manuals that uh, went with software programs yeah. well we commented on uh, the change in the doctoral training in the uh, area of strategy uh, could I ask you to kind of take a step back and comment on what you think are some of the important changes related to research methods and data analysis and strategy research that you've seen over the time in which you've been involved in the field? Right. Well, I would say, interestingly, again, uh, it's a younger field than you see in the micro side. And, and early on, uh, one of the things was to really bring a strong kind of set of st statistical tools into the use of uh, strategy and so on. I, I didn't do that. I think uh, you saw that at Purdue and, mm -hmm. and Schindel and, and others uh, did a lot of work on trying to bring that into the field. Uh, since then, now, we're trying to really do things. Again, we're kind of following our sister disciplines in OB and, and uh, HR, uh, now focusing a lot more on measurement and other issues that, that are really critical, but they're issues that have been addressed by our colleagues in other fields. Uh -huh. But we're trying to, uh, I think, and we are starting to, I don't want to say catch up, but we're trying to do a better job at it. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that there are areas uh, within uh, strategy that uh, have done a better job at integrating new methods and data analysis techniques? Uh, I'm not sure that there's any kind of stream or field where that's true. There probably is, uh, if you just look at the pure corporate strategy, competitive strategy, because there's, there are also some other areas that are process oriented and so on that uh, probably don't focus as much on the methodology. This may be unfair to some of my colleagues. And anytime you say one thing, there are going to be people there that do well. But but I don't think there's been a tremendous, you know, one field way, one, one sub area or field area, uh, some field is uh, ahead of the others. I think we're, we're all kind of struggling to continue to improve our methodologies in, in the field and strategy.
So it's a, it's a younger process than you see in the others. So um, I know that over your career, not only have you had great success as a scholar, uh, but you've been involved in the training of a lot of doctoral students who have gone on to success. Do you have advice that you would offer to doctoral students who want to uh, pursue a, a successful career as a researcher, mm -hmm. especially as it relates to research methods? Well, I'd say uh, one thing, and I, and I say this to my students now, uh, that, and, and I say stu not just my stu students in our PhD program and other consortia, is when you're in the program, uh, certainly take the methods course, you know, take any course that you can and, and any statistical tool that, that you're allowed and it fits your area. So don't, you learn as much as you can, but, but there's a part of, of doing research that uh, you're not going to pick up in books and you're not going to pick up necessarily in, uh, in the, uh, you know, the, the stat, stat courses. There's a tacit knowledge in doing research and doing it well, and that, what I would say is, Work with the faculty, not just to get publications, but work with the faculty to learn. And that means learn what they do, watch what they do, observe it. And I've seen students of mine that have gone out, I know that uh, we've worked on projects and I would watch them after. And I, I could see the ones that really paid attention to, to not just did their part that we asked them to do, whatever it was, but they paid attention and learned the other parts of the process, including the publication process, uh, and so there's a lot of tacit knowledge that's part of it as well, in my opinion. Yeah. So what, uh, again, to throw in an extra question here, what is it do you think that uh, that students, the first big aha experience that they learn about publicate the publication process that's different than what they thought it might be before they started getting involved with it? Well, I, I would guess that the aha comes when you submit your first paper and you get the decision back and reviews back. Uh, and, and many of them today already have been through that process, but oftentimes working with faculty. But it's different when you're in the lead role and you're having to, you have to make sure you answer those questions. So I, I and it sure be the other. There's certainly there's process issues and so on, but, but if you've made mistakes over here, you find out for sure when you submit it and get reviews back and get evaluations. So I would guess that that's a big moment. Yeah. Well, uh, Mike, as I mentioned uh, to everybody in the intro, uh, you're here to offer uh, a Karma Consortium webcast lecture. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Karma Consortium webcast program is a program that has a university membership uh, through which universities join, and they have access to webcasts that are offered during the year, as well as the recordings that are available from past years. Uh, I think if I've got it right, you will be the 72nd uh, lecture that we have hosted since uh, uh, we started this program in the fall of 2004. So with that kind of as background, could you talk a little bit about what you're going to be talking about this afternoon? I will. Uh, you know, this is going to be focused a lot on, uh, again, what, what we need in strategy and what we're doing right now in strategy. And I, I will talk about, I think you've seen the title. Uh, about the, using secondary research or secondary data in your research, but it, but it, I broadened it as I started developing this talk. Uh, I broadened it a little bit because uh, I realized one of the big issues, particularly using secondary, it, it's a big issue whether you have primary or secondary data, but it's certainly a big issue with secondary data. It's being able to match, develop and match your theory and method, which is very important no matter what you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about theory development first and then the matching uh, process as well as some measurement issues and so on related to secondary data, which I think make more sense when you talk about it that way, but I, I also think it's a, that issue is a broad issue for all of us that need to publish it. Okay. Uh, I usually like to close with uh, a couple of questions that try to help our, uh, our viewers know a little bit more about you than what they might otherwise by reading your work. So let me ask whether there's anything special that you do uh, to draw inspiration or motivation for your work. Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I think, uh, I don't know that I do anything special. What I have done for many years is I work on topics or uh, whatever that I find of interest. And 
that may lead me into kind of some different areas. And there was a conversation at dinner last night. Yeah, please. Where we talked about, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I remember I talked a little bit about that there's oftentimes a, an encouragement to focus your research, particularly if you're a young scholar, I think, to focus your research. And appropriately so, I mean, because it helps you, one, I think, do better research early and to become visible, you know, at least in some area, uh, more quickly. I haven't followed that path, and I haven't followed that path uh, for some time. Uh, but I did, I, I follow topics that I personally have an interest in. And I'll use an example. I mean, I'm, I'm a strategy person, been macro for some time. But uh, earlier in my career, I, I have personal interests in, uh, in what would now be called diversity research. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, discrimination, employment, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I followed it. Uh, now, we publish that work in good places, in general applied psychology, personnel psychology. But those aren't typical places for people in strategy to publish. Uh, but, but. That keeps me, if I'm interested in it, I'm going to do even a better job because I'm motivated to do it. So I, that's true even today. Things I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of international type work, and I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon as an example. But it's because I have, it, there's a personal interest as well as a professional scholarly interest. So I match the two. So I'm married. There you go. And um, then finally, uh, what, what is it that you like most and that you like least about your work? <laughs> well, uh, probably, uh, I, I inherently joy, enjoy doing research. You know, it's interesting. You, you don't, I don't think most of us know when you enter a PhD program. It depends on what you've done in your prior, getting an MBA is not a research degree. So I really hadn't done research uh, prior to getting into the PhD program. Uh, if you got an MS degree and did research, you might know better, and uh, whether you do or not. So I didn't really know that I would enjoy the research. I had done a little bit of teaching and I knew that I enjoyed teaching. But I, I inherently enjoyed doing research. You know, I enjoy the, the I, I particularly enjoy, not only design, what I really like is, is getting the data and then doing the first set of analyses and seeing the results. And, and hopefully they come out the way you expect. But, but just, I, I like doing that. I love uh, seeing the results, uh, all the work you put in to get to that point and see if it fits or, or at least partly fits what you've done. Uh, obviously, I, I enjoy when an acceptance letter comes back. <laughs> I think most of us do, whether it, it, no matter what it is. And you still do? And yeah, I still, I, I love that, yes. And I still like to see the last thing when it's in print. And probably the negative side is I don't like those rejection letters <laughs> and having to deal with reviewers even on R&Rs. So, but I think that's a pretty common, I would guess that most of our audience would say fairly similar things to that. Well, Mike, we, um, uh, it's really an honor to have you visiting Karma. Uh, you've been a big champion of research methods over the years, and uh, to come the distance from Texas A&M, uh, we thank you for sharing your thoughts about uh, strategic management research and careers, and we really look forward to your webcast lecture this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who may not know, that's karma.wayne.edu. You can find more information. Uh, let me also take the opportunity to plug our Karma Global Short Course Series. Uh, I'll be down in Australia in uh, early uh, April and finishing up in Hong Kong in late June. We have 16 of them that we'll be hosting here at Wayne State University in the middle of May. You can find more information about that on our website. Uh, Mike, thanks again. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure.